Good afternoon. I'm John Stewart Gordon, and welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery's series of East Study Tours, generously sponsored by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. Today, we're visiting the Leslie P. and George H. Hume Furniture Study, located at Yale West Campus. There are sure to be many questions generated by today's talk, and we're going to leave time at the end to discuss them. But you can enter your question using the Q&A feature at any point during the presentation. I'll be monitoring, and I'll make sure your question doesn't get lost. It's my pleasure to introduce Patricia E. Kane, the Friends of American Art Curator of American Decorative Arts and Catherine Silverman, the Assistant Conservator of Furniture and Objects, as they pursue the pursuit of comfort, upholstery in America. Hello, everyone. Today, Kathy and I will explore the history of upholstery in America from the 17th century to the 20th century with objects in the Hume Furniture Study. Upholstery adds a great deal to our interiors. Upholstered furniture employs uh, built up foundations of soft materials that are covered in fabrics or leather. And that, that those foundations really cushion the body uh, from what could otherwise be very hard surfaces. These materials also envelop the body offering coziness and protection from drafts. In short, upholstery makes seating furniture comfortable. The covering materials add color and texture to our environments, making them more alluring and livable. Upholstery is not limited to seating furniture, but that's where we find its widest use. And it adds significant cost to completing an object. Traditionally, upholstery was a whole different branch of the furniture trade. Um, and uh, in early America, a cabinet maker or a chair maker would have provided a wooden frame that he del delivered to an upholsterer who did the rest. Today, Kathy will first discuss what is underneath uh, the materials, uh, underneath what we see on the exterior and discuss them, those materials and techniques and how they changed over time. Then we will look at original upholstery in the furniture study and chart for you a chronology of how the uh, exterior covering, sometimes referred to as show covers, changed over time. Um, hello. Um... I first actually became interested in conservation through upholstery. Um, I spent some time in my 20s working in a commercial upholstery workshop in Bristol in England. Um, so during that time, I re-upholstered a number of um, Victorian armchairs and Chesterfield sofas and such like. Um, but I should say that although I am now the furniture conservator and responsible for the upholstered furniture um, at the gallery, um, the upholstery conservation is actually a discipline in its own right. Um, but that said, it's fairly unusual to have an in-house upholstery conservator um, because it's such a, a specialised field. Um, so whilst I have an understanding of upholstery conservation and experience in upholstery, I would and would happily take on um, simpler upholstery conservation treatments, I probably would outsource um, or at least consult a specialist upholstery conservator for more complicated treatments. Um, so as Pat said, before we um, look at some of the seating furniture in the collection, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the um, anatomy of upholstered furniture. Um, when people think about upholstered furniture, they're often thinking about what they can see when they look at the piece of furniture. So the fabric covering and the trimmings, um, such as the braid and the brass nails. Um, but that's actually just a, a small part of what an upholsterer does. Um, it's the, the stuff underneath that's actually really important because um, it's the up, under upholstery or, or the foundation upholstery that um, helps to create the, the profile or form of the upholstery, um, as well as um, determining how comfortable that the upholstery will be. 
Uh, many methods and materials have been used through the centuries, far too many to go into um, in this presentation, but I'm just going to um, mention some of the key techniques and important innovations. Um, and we're also going to look in a little more detail at, a, uh, at the buildup of an 18th century upholstered seat. Um, so upholstered structures are typically built up in layers um, the first layer at the bottom is usually the webbing and the final layer is the fabric covering um, uh, referred to as the top cover or the show cover. Um, the webbing is usually applied in, uh, in a sort of woven lattice and you can just about make, make it out here beneath the sackcloth but we'll be seeing plenty of examples of webbing um, up close later in the presentation. Um, and an upholsterer uses a tool called a webbing stretcher, um, which is levered against the frame and it, it pulls the webbing um, really tight so that it's under quite a bit of tension um, when it's tacked to the frame. And that's important to create a, a good strong seat. Um, and when I worked in the upholstery workshop, I used to pluck at the webbing and if it made a nice pinging noise, um, that indicated that it was sufficiently taut. The layers in between the webbing and the show cover are called fills. And this um, slide shows some examples of common filling materials. So with the earliest fixed upholstery, it would usually be a single filling material um, that would be sandwiched um, between the webbing and the show cover. Uh, but this sort of upholstery easily became misshapen and that led to attempts to tether the filling in place using by stitching through the layers. Um, so sometimes you see quilting or tufting. By the middle of the 18th century, you find um, multiple layers of fillings separated by cloth. Um, and often they use denser, more durable fills at the bottom and softer fills um, such as down at the top. So here is the, the chair we saw before with the webbing and the sackcloth. Um, and they've now added the first layer of filling. They've used some sort of curled hair. Um, the best stuff used to be made from horses, tails and manes. And they'd pass the hair over a sharp edge to give it a curl. In the 18th century, they used various te stitching techniques to create more controlled and structured shapes. Um, and so here they've applied a, a second layer of sackcloth over the top of the of the filling um, and they've tacked it around the edge and the upholsterer is creating a rolled edge by compressing the stuffing at the edge um, using stitches. And you have a, a second layer of filling here. In this case, they've used the same filling material as before, but as I mentioned, that's not always the case. And then over the top of that, there'll probably be yet another layer of, of sackcloth, um, perhaps something more tightly woven. Um, and the purpose of that, as well as holding the second layer of stuffing in place, is that um, it would prevent the filling material from poking through the, the show cover. And here they've, they've added the show cover and they've also added some brass nailing, which is decorative. Um, in the 19th century, we have a, a major innovation in the form of spiral compression springs. Um, I have one here, in fact, um, and they um, probably grew out of the use of steel springs in other industries like clock making and carriage making. And it enabled upholsterers to create a more comfortable and more resilient seat. So on the left, um, you can see that the springs have been evenly spaced um, across and stitched to the webbing. And on the right, the springs have been lashed with twine um, using a series of knots and it's then been tacked to the frame. And that creates a, a stable base. Uh, Mid-century furniture fans may be familiar with tension springs, which are often clearly visible on the furniture. Um, these allow designers to create slimmer profiles because they no longer had to create a deep section to accommodate um, spiral springs. And they were often used in combination with latex rubber cushioning, um, which um, was introduced around about the same time. 
And um, here we have another 20th century innovation, or uh, probably more accurate to say adaptation, um, which is the spring unit. Um, these were pre-made and they basically could be dropped in and they were um, really appropriate for mass manufactured furniture, much quicker to install um, and required less skill as well. And, and on the back of this sofa, you can see zigzag springs, um, which are sometimes called S springs or serpentine springs, um, which again are, are quicker to install than the spiral springs. And then this is my uh, kind of catch-all slide to, to cover foam and other man-made materials that came in in the 20th century and, and just totally revolutionized the world of upholstery. Um, so now we're on to our first example from the collection. And it's an example of upholstery conservation. And I wanted just to talk about the difference between upholstery conservation and traditional upholstery. Um, traditional upholstery is a highly skilled craft practice and it takes years to learn. Um, and the methods were used throughout much of the 20th century, including here at the gallery for restoration. Um, but the problem is, especially concerning furniture in museum collections, that the techniques are inherently destructive. So here um, you can see an x-ray which shows the huge number of tacks used to attach the upholstery to the frame. Um, and a piece of furniture might be upholstered many times during its lifetime. Maybe the upholstery becomes shabby or fails um, or just to account for changing tastes. And each time more and more tacks are driven into the wood frame. So on the right, you can see an example um, of a damaged wooden frame, um, that the damage that results from several campaigns of, of upholstery. And on the left, you can see just one of the ways that, um, that um, restorers um, deal with, with damaged frames. So they've applied a, a, a fabric um, with glue to, to the damaged edge so that the upholsterer has something to tack into. So in conservation, this led to the development in the US in the 80s of, of something called non-invasive upholstery, um, or sometimes it's called tactless upholstery. And that's a system of replicating the aesthetic um, without um, requiring the insertion of metal fasteners, so tacks or staples. Um, so no additional holes are created in the frame. Um, and this approach can be adopted relatively easily um, in a straightforward treatment such as this chair. Um, the conservator has used polyethylene foam blocks, which they've shaped to fit within the seat frame, and then a, a bit of polyester batting over the top for loft. Um, and then the fabric finish has been um, pinned underneath to the foam. And the decorative brass nails that you can see, they've had their shanks cut off and, and then just the heads are attached to the fabric using a hot glue gun. Um, and this is an example of a much more complicated non-invasive non upholstery treatment by um, a really amazing upholstery conservator called Leroy Graves. Um, and you can see he's created all these different parts that just um, slot onto the original frame without the need for tax. Um, and I should probably say that this type of upholstery usually um, wouldn't be at all comfortable because it's made out of hard foam um, and it's not normally designed to support the weight of a person. So it often isn't really compatible with um, seating furniture that's in daily use. And then over to Pat. Thank you, Kathy. And this is the first um, example in the furniture study that we're going to look at. Um, it's our earliest example of original upholstery, uh, a leather chair that has an upholstered back and seat and the uprights between those two are actually also upholstered. And we acquired this chair because it did have a very early upholstery um, treatment. Uh, chairs of this type would have been the high end, the most expensive end of 17th century furniture. 
And another material also used on them is a woven material called, um, and they were referred to as um, turkey work chairs because the woven material uh, imitated Turkish uh, carpets. So here we have a close up look at the uh, leather on this chair. You'll notice, um, however, that the leather on the uprights is much darker than the leather on the seat. There's also on the side rail, you see empty holes. And indeed, the material on the back and the seat is not the original. Um, and there's a nice example of some old tacks here as well um, with rose heads, which are, are quite different from the flat headed machine stamped tacks that we start seeing in the early um, 19th century. And this tear in the upholstery material on the back gives us a wonderful peek into what the chair is stuffed with. And if your eyesight is very sharp, you might notice little leaves and uh, uh, rather stiff stems. And indeed, this upholsterer has used fern or bracken as his stuffing. Uh, and um, upholsters, I think, often just went out in the backyard and uh, if they were going to use grasses or natural stuffings, just cl clipped uh, in their surroundings what they could use to stuff a piece of furniture. So when we look at the underside of the chair, we see its foundation here on the left really quite intact. And what I'm showing you on the right are examples of 18th century webbing below, which has a twill weave and it's made of linen. It's rather narrow. It's the kind of webbing that was used in saddlery, but also in upholstery. And above that is 19th or 20th century jute webbing, not made of such a durable material and uh, often woven with these very wide red um, bands. But on the uh, foundation on the left, um, you see two vertical bands of webbing, which I think are the originals. And then going crosswise, areas uh, where the fabric is light, where it was originally protected by the horizontal bands. At some point, they disappeared. And in the 18th century, again, because it's narrow and twill woven, you see a replacement webbing down below. So I think the tan colored leather on this chair is probably a, a treatment that was done about a century after the chair was first made. The uh, preferred uh, leather uh, in the 18th century for upholstery was uh, Russia leather, which is actually reindeer hide. And here you see a whole hide and at the top you can see the reindeer's tail and at the bottom uh, its head with little eye sockets. Uh, and uh, this leather was uh, tanned and curried in Russia using um, birch oil, which gave it a very um, distinctive smell. And the surface was scored as you see in the lower um, right corner of the slide with a kind of cross hatched pattern. This hide actually uh, came from a Dutch ship that sank off the coast of Plymouth, England uh, in the 1790s and it was excavated in the 1990s and um, um, uh, hides were sold to further the excavation of the ship and they, it's, they're amazing survivors in the fact that they still retain their suppleness and they still smell like birch oil. Now moving into the 18th century, we have this Irish chair in the collection, which has a very um, beautiful and original uh, needlework uh, covering. Uh, it's needlework um, in a tradition called canvas work in which you have a rather loosely woven ground that is then um, uh, uh, embroidered with wool uh, threads. In this case, um, uh, reds and blues and yellows to create this all, all over um, uh, design. 
the um, covering of this chair has been off and completely restored. And I know you had some thoughts on that, Kathy, about the treatment. Yeah, I, I just felt that the um, they've obviously used a, a, a dark brown, quite solid colored backing fabric to support the, the original fragile textile. Um, and, and I find it quite distracting. Your eye is really sort of drawn to the losses in a way rather than the, the beautiful um, needlework. Um, and I think if we were going to redo it again, we might um, use something that was a little bit less distracting. And here you see a detail of that uh, loosely woven canvas work, um, the dark background that uh, is the new upholstery um, base that Kathy was referring to. And below the very large, beautiful um, brass tacks, a little bit of the original blue uh, trim. The back of the chair is upholstered with uh, a, a very hard uh, woolen fabric. The underside uh, is in fabulous condition uh, and shows the interlaced uh, webbing and the sackcloth um, uh, on which the first layer of filling sits. More typical, uh, not really typical, but if original upholstery survives in America, um, uh, having a slip seat embroidered again in canvas work, in this case uh, with tent stitch, uh, in a, um, the Irish stitch, excuse me, um, uh, that we see here on this uh, chair made in the Wethersfield, Connecticut area, and probably worked about 1745 by a young woman named Abigail Porter. Um, like many uh, well-to-do young women, Abigail was probably sent to a dame's school by her parents where she would have learned needlework, music, painting, along with uh, being educated in English and um, arithmetic. And uh, her parents would have very proudly uh, displayed um, the sign, these signs of her accomplishment, like the um, embroidered seat covers in their parlors. Uh, and if you, we could have the next slide, Kathy, uh, I think it's significant that uh, Abigail's initials are cut into the frame of this chair. In fact, perhaps her parents uh, had this furniture made uh, to become her wedding furniture and in her new household, uh, her actual ownership of uh, the chair was indicated by her initials in it. And in this detail uh, that you see on um, the other screen, uh, it's amazing how the wool um, Irish stitch in this uh, canvas work is really still pretty vibrant, um, even though it's fairly faded. The underside of the seat is uh, quite intact with uh, interlaced um, early uh, twill woven uh, webbing um, that we've seen earlier. So from Newport, Rhode Island, uh, there's really quite an extraordinary uh, group of either needlework or embroidered easy chair covers. And it's the only place in America where such covers um, survive. Uh, this uh, example is not in the uh, furniture study. Um, but it has this beautiful uh, tobacco colored Maureen on which has been embroidered in uh, Romanian Kuching all uh, these very large flowers and furling uh, leaves all springing from a basket at the base of the back. And th this rear view of the chair shows the original webbing and then um, uh, some reinforcement of uh, jute webbing. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a, an example of the difficulty that, that someone has had repairing a chair where the webbing has failed and that they're unable to tack the new bit of webbing to the front of the frame without removing the rest of the upholstery. So they've tacked it to the, the inner edge. Um, 
of the of the frame and it's very difficult to achieve that uh, the degree of tension that that i mentioned before that you need to to have strong webbing um and i think that's like actually quite com common problem for people repairing upholstery is that when the foundation upholstery fails you want to deal with it without removing the layers on top so you find yourself in very awkward positions kind of working blind with your arms up inside the guts of the chair trying to compress a spring or, or whatever And in the furniture study, we do have um, this remarkable uh, easy chair, very similar to the one we just looked at. And uh, in the infrared photograph on the screen, you can see shadows of what was originally on the show cover of this chair. And it's a pattern, these large flowers and leaves, very much like the, uh, the previous example. And so the Romanian Cooching with which these flowers were uh, created uh, is a very thick form of woolen uh, embroidery and it kept dirt from passing through the embroidery onto the sackcloth. And so we have these wonderful ghosts of what was originally here on this chair. And on the wings, uh, the edges of the wings, some of the original uh, embroidery and the original milk chocolate uh, maureen wool ground uh, fabric remain uh, and um, the previous chair had a similar chain of floral decoration going down the wings we also have here a very small strip of the original green tape that was used on this chair still surviving The back, like the previous chair, shows the similar problem of trying to reinforce the old webbing with a new webbing. And uh, we get a wonderful view in this break at the bottom of the uh, back uh, uh, foundation of the stuffing. Uh, and uh, the curator of the Yale Herbarium actually took samples of this grass that's growing, that's used to stuff this chair and identify it as sedge, which is a very common uh, grass that grows up and down the eastern seacoast. And, and this is actually a, a good example of um, the damage that I was talking about. You can see the number of holes that are in that rail at the bottom of the photo on the right. So um, the embroidered uh, examples of 18th century upholstery are really uh, um, few and far between. Uh, what was more common as an upholstery uh, material was uh, wool damask. And we have this one example in the collection, the slip seat of this chair that was made in um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, probably about 1765. And uh, in the next slide, we get a little more close up of the, um, the damask. Uh, the damask weave has a, a satin weave that um, weft that woven weft on the surface and then a sateen weave uh, in the warp and so you get this um, light and dark surface and I think if you look closely, you can see that we have the same kind of large blossoms and leaves as part of this design and you may think that this very tattered slip seat is um, really an eyesore, but for a curator like myself, it really makes my heart go pity pat to uh, have an example of 18th century fabric like this survive. And notice also that um, this, the webbing on this seat is much more economical than on Abigail Porter's chair where we had uh, four straps. Here we've only got three. By the end of the 18th century, uh, a whole uh, new kind of fabric comes into uh, fashion, and that is hair cloth. And we see it here on uh, the slip seat of a cherry chair uh, made, uh, originally owned, it said, by Noah Webster, who lived in the Hartford area and Connecticut area. And that's probably where the chair was made. Um, in comparison to the wool damask, the um, the hair cloth has even more sheen, as you can see in the overall. It's a very shiny surface. 
Um, and it was woven um, with, um, if we could have the next, Kathy, with uh, uh, warp threads that were cotton. Those are the, thre uh, the threads running up and down in this uh, sample. And then the weft threads were actually the horse hair. And again, it's hair that comes either from the mane or tail of, of the horses. And uh, it didn't necessarily, um, you couldn't necessarily do a whole uh, run of the weft. These fabrics were typically woven to about 21 or 22 inches. And often when you run your hand over uh, old hair cloth, uh, there are a lot of little pricks that come from where the horse's hairs are sticking out. Um, the webbing on this particular example uh, is very colorful, um, having bands that are uh, woven in both green and sort of an olive, an olive green and red. Um, I remember reading, Pat, that, um, that in England at least, um, hair cloth along with leather was felt to be very um, appropriate for dining furniture because it didn't absorb um, odors from food and um, maybe it could be more easily wiped down. Um, is that something that you would you say that's the same case in American furniture? Um, that I don't know for sure. I'm sure there is evidence of um, that in literature. Uh, I don't have that at my fingertips, but it certainly makes sense. Um, leather was by and large the uh, go-to upholstery material throughout the 18th century. Uh, probably for the reasons you've just uh, said. Um, and hair cloth, of course, would have also been, it's a very durable um, mm -hmm. material and uh, could be wiped down, whereas uh, wool um, would have spotted and soiled from having food or drink um, dropped on it. Interesting. Moving now to the mid 19th century, we have this example in the furniture study, like our earliest leather chair, it simply has an upholstered back panel and upholstered seat. And it's actually the first um, uh, instance of, uh, that we're going to look at of the use of springs in the seat um, <clears throat> that Kathy showed us in uh, her slides. And the sprung seats, often the uh, uh, twine that's used to lash those springs often breaks and so the seats become um, uh, disformed as this one uh, is. It's sort of higher in the back than it is in the front. When this chair came into the collection, it was um, covered with this light uh, green cotton velvet. And uh, since that material wasn't really appropriate, we decided to strip it. And lo and behold, when we started tearing off this uh, cotton velvet, uh, on the back, we had this wonderful um, patterned wool mohair, um, which uh, in, although the chairs in the Renaissance revival style, the wool mohair uh, is really in the Rococo revival style. And it's uh, reviving those very large flowers and furling leaves that we saw on the mid 18th century embroidered chairs. And in this detail, um, I just wanted to, you know, emphasize how these rolled edges, which Kathy talked about in her slides, um, are uh, the way this classic upholstery is done. And that very boxy square edge that you see uh, is very hard and tough and uh, made for a very crisp outline. The, uh, the seat of this chair, of course, had lost uh, its original show cover, uh, a very common problem. The seats give out before the backs do. And uh, our solution to make the chair exhibitable was to find a wool uh, velvet that was uh, compatible color-wise and upholster, have the seat reupholstered with that material, which is what you see in this slide. Now, I haven't mentioned silk at all in this, this talk because um, uh, this is our first example of original silk um, uh, upholstery in the collection. Um, uh, 
silk might have been used in America in the 18th century, but if it was, it was used very, very uh, rarely. Um, but by the mid 19th century, certainly, uh, silks were becoming much more widely available. And what you have here is a reception chair um, by the New York decorating firm of Herder Brothers in the late 19th century. They were the go-to decorating firm in New York City. Uh, it's got this wonderful purpley um, silk fabric that has gold threads shot through it. Um, but the thing that really um, takes my breath away with this chair is that it has its original fringes and uh, trims uh, surviving. Uh, and these, again, are silk. And I hope on the, the band at the bottom, which is across the uh, near the top of the chair, you, get, you can really sense the chenille, the fuzzy, uh, silk um, um, areas of this of this trim. Um, I don't know what um, the original um, um, uh, commission uh, environment this this chair lived in, but I'm sure it was a highly decorated uh, 19th century interior. When we get to the 20th century, things change dramatically. Um, because uh, man-made materials uh, enter into uh, the upholstery trade. And what we're showing you here is um, a womb chair, an ottoman, designed by Aero Saarinen in 1948 for the Knoll uh, Company. And it is uh, covered in its original wool and ran pulley pattern um, textile designed by Marianne Strengel for the Knoll uh, company. And um, uh, the foundation of this chair, however, is um, latex. And uh, the latex, while it was once very spongy and cushiony, uh, has now become very hard and brittle. And although this is the youngest example of upholstery um, uh, that we're showing you today, original upholstery, uh, it is in the most fragile condition, which is really sort of ironic. Um, and there's really nothing, I don't think, Kathy, that can be done with a, um, an upholstery foundation like this. Yeah, you're, you're right that, um, that while traditional upholstery materials like horsehair can um, have a lifetime of several hundred years, um, many of these more modern materials are, are pretty unpredictable. Um, and the degradation of upholstery foams um, like we have here is a, is a significant issue with mid-century furniture. Um, so we can't really halt the degradation, but we can ensure that it's handled very carefully to reduce the potential for, for the foam becoming compressed. Um, and, and any other treatment would be very invasive because it would probably involve um, removing um, the foam and replacing it with something else, which would require unstitching um, all the cover, all the coverings. Yes, you can see on the uh, left wing of this chair where um, the fabric is sort of um, uh, wrinkled. Uh, that's because uh, the the what remains of the latex has been compressed, and so the fabric has nothing really to support it. Thank you so much for that survey of techniques and approaches to upholstery. I'm going to give everyone a second or two to add your questions to the Q&A. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to share one quick story about this womb chair, because um, we lent it to a great exhibition that the Bar Graduate Center did on null textiles. And it was exhibited next to the original sample of Marion Strangle's Pooley, which is white. So um, another thing that you have to think about when you're thinking at upholstery is how the color changes. And um, the foam in this chair is orange. So as it's been degrading and getting um, crusty, it's been leaching into the white. So it's now a very kind of tame ivory color. Um, but so um, another thing you have to watch out for. 
But one person was intrigued by the Russia leather because um, they've seen that similar kind of di uh, the dicing or the diaper pattern on calfskin bindings. So they were wondering if the term Russia leather is um, a specific subsect, is it always reindeer hide or is it kind of uh, more of a general term? Um, I have read that um, Russia leather can be cowhide. Um, and um, to my knowledge, no one has ever tested the surviving um, 18th century or 17th century examples of Russia leather on furniture um, to establish whether they're cows or reindeer, uh, which I'm sure a scientist probably could do. Um, the the cross hatching um, I'm sure is probably used in other areas where um, uh, tanning and currying of of leather um, is is done. I don't think it's unique to Russia leather, but um, the, the Russia leather that you find on old Russia leather you find on furniture typically has that um, cross hatched um, pattern. Yeah, and I believe they used these kind of grooved brass rollers. So they'd roll in one direction to make stripes and then over in the other direction. And that was what made the diamond pattern. And some things you see now, they're kind of scored, which probably weakens the leather, um, whereas um, because they're essentially embossing the leather with the Russian um, technique, then it, it remains quite strong. Moving forward in time, um, actually, it's probably a general question. Uh, our, our friend Robin Jaffe Frank is um, curious about the relationship between the, the shape of upholstery and the textiles chosen. Um, and, it, and did that follow um, the shape and textiles of women's fashion? I sort of, um, I don't know that it's really related to women's um, fashion. Um, with the um, uh, easy chairs we showed for the mid 18th century, um, the the inner surfaces of those chairs, and I perhaps should have pointed that out, uh, tend to be very full and very rounded. But I think that was a question of providing really, you know, a kind of uh, comfortable, soft um, um, surface to uh, lounge against. Um, the slip seats are usually, you know, these trapezoidal seats that um, in both cases, the wool damask we showed and the um, the horsehair uh, seat we showed, they're really relatively slim uh, in terms of their overall uh, profile. They aren't particularly puffy. Now, granted, they're uh, two, three hundred years old, so they definitely the stuffings have probably um, compressed in inside them. Um, I don't know. What would you say about that question, Kathy? Um, well, I was thinking that in some ways, I, I, not necessarily that it, it correlates to, but it, it definitely responds to women's fashion sometimes in the, I'm thinking of kind of chairs that were for women in the 19th century versus ones that were for men. And the women's ones are often kind of more upright. And I think because the women had to wear corsets, so they, they couldn't really lounge in the same way that men were able to lounge. And, and I think there's probably some examples that are a bit bigger, maybe to a, accommodate a crinoline or, or what have you. Um. Um, so someone is asking about the red stripes on the jute webbing and was, as long as we're talking about decorative versus functional, were those stripes decorative or functional? I have just assumed that they are um, uh, decorative, but uh, I'm not an upholsterer, so I don't know, Kathy, do they provide any kind of um, 
guidelines for, um, um, you know, something um, like with the, the springs, um, do they provide a, a guideline for a place where the spring would be, would be um, tacked to the, uh, not, but sewn to the, to the webbing? I mean, I've never really used them in that way, although there will be points when you want, you know, two and then three and you kind of space them out um, when you're attaching the webbing and things. But I, I, I can't say that I ever really felt that I required the stripes to do that. And I don't know whether it has any kind of structural purpose in the way that it's woven. I'm not sure. You know, we saw in a few examples of the 18th century webbing, uh, notably the uh, um, seat on the Noah Webster chair, that it had decorative bands of colorful uh, red and green bands uh, as part of its uh, uh, woven pattern. And so maybe the, the, the jute uh, with, with typically red, but also black lines uh, is imitating um, the earlier uh, uh, webbing patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, the use of kind of modern materials is sparking some interest. Um, to ease us into this topic, um, someone is asking about the same, the types of latex foam rubber used on um, this type of latex foam rubber used on modern furniture. And I know this is a whole subsect of, of um, conservation, but they're wondering, you know, are people like Warren Plattner um, using the same type of foam um, that Aro Saarinen is? I, I don't know. I know that um, latex has changed over, the over time and that it used to be made from um, the natural latex um, out of trees. And now that they use a kind of synthetic um, equivalent, sort of chemically similar. Um, so when you buy a, a latex um, mattress in this day and age, it's, it's, it may not always be made from true latex. Um, but um, in terms of like how, how they vary from maker to maker within a, a sort of relatively short time frame, I'm, I'm not really sure. I bet someone's written a paper on it. Yeah, and it's, it's almost like dendrochronology. You can date your chair by um, the composition of the latex. It's a mm -hmm. fascinating idea. Um, so to switch from um, synthetics used purposely to um, added synthetics, um, there's one, one of our visitors is um, championing the um, keeping the craft of being able to do rolled edges and uh, they think that that's a skill that they need, they say needs to be kept alive. So they're a little concerned about the use of polystyrene blocks um, and what kind of um, kind of methodological issues there are between recreating the handicraft versus introducing um, new synthetic materials and to what extent. Yes, I have to say that I agree. And I think it's really important that the traditional craft skills are kept alive. And I think it, it does depend what you're working on, but there are some situations where it's really important that the, that the frame isn't damaged. Um, and somewhere it's not. I, I, in, in the UK, at least, there, there is a, a sort of very um, healthy, um, uh, traditional upholstery um, industry that's still going. So a lot of people do um, still practice those those craft practices. And, and I suspect that most upholstery conservators trained in that to start with. So they are able to um, to replicate those things um, in certain situations. Um, and I think, Kathy, as you said in your in your in your talk, um, this uh, the eth the non intrusive upholstery um, is really only used um, for museum collections. Um, maybe some collectors have a few objects that they never let anybody sit on, um, uh, because you know those methods cannot support weight. Um, and I, I'm sure there's a lot more upholstery um, done uh, for people who have antique furniture, for instance, that does have to use uh, these traditional methods mm -hmm. to make um, a, a foundation that will support 
on people sitting in the, in the chairs or sofas. Right. And there's also, um, I sort of talked about the extremes, but there actually is this middle ground as well, which is um, sort of semi-invasive um, techniques. So where people are reusing old holes when they're adding tax, um, or also um, the use of staples, whilst that's not traditional, you can be using you know, the traditional techniques, but using staples um, uh, which are less damaging to frames. Um, they, they just create very tiny holes and it doesn't require multiple blows of a, of a hammer um, to, to um, you know, you just have one, one kind of hit with a staple gun and, and it's in. Um, and they're also easier if you were to be repeatedly um, upholstering things. They're, they're less damaging to remove as well because uh, you can often get them out I mean, it's a real pain, but you can get them out using um, uh, staple removers and pliers rather than, again, having to use a, a ripping chisel and a hammer to, to knock them out. So, yeah, so there's these sort of halfway house measures. So there's kind of a, a, a part two to this question, which I'm intrigued by. Maybe um, Pat can take the lead on it, is about how you um, represent original upholstery versus any kind of um, secondary lives of upholstery on museum labels. How is it, how is a visitor supposed to know the upholstery history? That is an excellent uh, question. Uh, certainly the, um, the Renaissance Revival uh, chair <clears throat> that we showed you has been exhibited in the art gallery. Um, the problem, of course, with things that uh, do have um, original textiles or leather on them is that they are um, light sensitive for the most part. And so um, they, you know, tend not to be exhibited for long periods of time. Um, but I do not think that um, uh, maybe, maybe I've forgotten, but whether we said in the chat for that chair um, that the uh, uh, back, uh, the uh, patterned wool mohair on the back was original um, and um, uh, the, the seat uh, was not. Um, I, I would imagine in exhibiting that chair as I think about it now, we, we probably drew attention to the fact that it retained its original uh, wool uh, mohair. Uh, we have another object in the collection, an, an Egyptian revival sofa, uh, in which uh, it has a completely new show cover. Um, but one of the reasons we acquired that for the collection was its original foundation, again, with the exception of the um, seat, as I recall, had uh, survived. And in fact, the back still retained um, shards of the original sort of Kelly green uh, silk damask. And um, I believe in the label for that sofa, we refer to the fact that the show cover uh, replicates uh, as close as possible um, what uh, was on the sofa originally and that survives uh, underneath this um, uh, replaced uh, show cover. Does that get at the heart of that question, John, or is there some dimension here I'm not quite um, well, understanding? I, think, I, mean, I do want to thank um, Celia Hopkinson for this really uh, provocative question. And um, I think your answer that gets to how do we signal what is old um, you know, is but I, a part of, I think, her question is, how do we signal what's new? So, um, you know, on that the federal side chair, do we say it is, you know, mahogany and polystyrene? We do not. No. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a good question. Um, um, uh, perhaps we should. I mean, typically in. Um, the chair catalog, for instance, um, in the medium line on 
the uh, in a publication we indicated um, that you know this chair is upholstered with Schumacher pattern D5104 or something like that. Um, but I don't think that kind of information uh, makes it into the gallery label. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it should. Um, so um, people would know that what they're looking at is not uh, an 18th or a 19th um, um, textile or 20th century textile for that matter. The one last question, um, in so many of the examples you've shown um, original upholstery as a guide or original remnants and scraps as a guide for um, treatment and reupholstery, what should you do if you have none of that original material left? Uh, how do you figure out what uh, an, a piece of furniture should look like? Um, so I, I could um, say something here. Um, so first of all, when if we're removing non-original upholstery, um, we do that extremely carefully because even when there might not be an entire layer or even a, a scrap of, of the original textile left, there sometimes can be, you know, just a few fibers um, that's still sort of wrapped around an original tack. Um, and from those fibers, you, you might be able to tell what color it was, whether it's silk or wool, for example. So that's um, really important information. Um, and then um, you can also look for clues. Um, so you, there might be a, a pattern left where you've had decorative nailing, which can give you an idea um, just from the little holes. Um, and then, um, of course, we can look to um, other examples, similar examples, um, which may have retained their original upholstery um, in, in other collections. Um, but another really good place to look is in um, sort of contemporaneous paintings. Um, so painters like John Singleton Copley, um, he's like such a wonderful attention to detail that you really can tell an awful lot about upholstered furniture um, by looking at, at how he's painted it. And um, you can see, you know, what would have been an appropriate textile and also, um, you know, what the profile would be, you know, is it a deep seat or how does it curve, um, which is information that that you um, just don't have once the under upholstery has been removed. We actually, um, in the various objects in the collection that have been upholstered over the years, um, we have a William and Mary style daybed that um, had some early 20th century textile on it. And when we actually um, stripped it, um, as Kathy said, under one of the, the nails, uh, the original nails, we did find a little tuft of um, a sort of bluish green uh, wool. Um, it seemed like wool mohair to us. And so we were able to find um, a, wool, a reproduction wool mohair that very came very close to um, the original color and type of material that was on on such an object, and that that can be very gratifying when you have that kind of evidence that uh, guides um, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That was our final question. So. Well, we thank everybody for uh, coming today and uh, listening. And uh, we would really uh, very much like to extend our thanks also to our gallery staff members who were really um, essential in uh, producing the images um, that we've been able to share with you today. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you.